My name is Hamza Azur Salam and you're watching the Pakistan Daily. Today we're with the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Senate of Pakistan, Senator Mushahid Hussain Sayyid, and we're going to talk about the Asian century and what it means for Pakistan. So thank you for joining us today, Mushahid sir. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to Islamabad. Thank you. In this nice spring weather. <laughs> thank you for having us, uh, Mushahid sir. It's so, a pleasure. So, um, Shahid sir, what does the term Asian century signify? Asian century signifies a number of things. It signifies a dream which was foreseen by Asian philosophers almost a century ago, now turning into a reality. It signifies a shift in the global balance of economic and political power from the West to the East. It signifies the resurgence of Asia. It signifies that Asia in the 21st century will play a pivotal role, whether it's economy, politics, and culture. And for me, as a Pakistani, it signifies two very important declarations made by our founding fathers. Allama Iqbal, 90 years ago had talked about it. Dekh, mashrik se uberte hue suraj ko dekh. See the sun rising from the east. The east had not risen. The first world war had just ended. Colonial domination was paramount. But Alama Iqbal foresaw the resurgence of China. Gara khab chini sambalne lage, himala ke chashme obalne lage. Gya dor sarmaya dari gya. Tamasha dikha ke madari gya. That kind of thing. And Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. His first interview after the creation of Pakistan to a foreign journalist was to the American journalist Margaret Bork White in Life magazine. And you can see it on the internet. It was January 1948. And he was asked, what is Pakistan's role going to be? And he said, Pakistan is the pivot of the world placed on the frontier on which the future geopolitics revolves. Mm -hmm. And today, when we see Pakistan, its role, its location, we see that vision coming true. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've seen Asia grow exponentially, but how can Pakistan uh, capitalize on the Asian century? Well, Pakistan, as Qaedism rightly said, has been playing a pivotal role. And if you see, just have a look at the last 50 years mm -hmm. of global politics. Mm -hmm. We have been virtually, for good or for bad, in the eye of the storm. Mm -hmm. In 1971, Pakistan was the bridge between the US and China. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kissinger flew mm -hmm. on that secret visit to Beijing mm -hmm. from Islamabad in July 1971, almost 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was recently in a seminar in Beijing on 20th of March. And uh, the two keynote speakers were Dr. Kissinger himself and I have followed him mm -hmm. from Pakistan. And he, he praised Pakistan's role. Mm -hmm. So that was a turning point in global politics 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. We played the role. Mm -hmm. The last big battle of the Cold War in the 20th century, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. we were the frontline state. Uh, we helped in the collapse of uh, communism in Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, the demolition of the Berlin Wall, mm -hmm. the liberation of Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. and uh, again a shift uh, in the global balance of power because the Cold War ended. Then mm -hmm. the first big, big battle of the 21st century, the so-called War on Terror, we have been the frontline state. And even now we are a pivotal player. So our role has been always very, very significant. Mm -hmm. But what is important is we have not been able to capitalize it to our full advantage. Mm -hmm. Today we have what I call strategic space for the next two, three, four years. Mm -hmm. A geopolitical breather, thanks to the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, mm -hmm. CPEC, which is the most important developmental and uh, diplomatic project for us. Mm -hmm. Then we have a important role in the Afghanistan peace process. Mm -hmm. Pakistan is playing the role in providing an honorable exit to the US after they have lost the war in Afghanistan. 
and now the US has already announced that on 9/11 September 11th 2021 they will militarily leave Afghanistan so we are again one of the key issues of the last 40 years we are the key player in that hmm. and then our issues of connectivity and uh, in this context there is no pressure from america to do more india is under its own pressures because mm -hmm. of the pandemic because of the failed economy because of uh, mr modi's bullying of the neighbors they got a thrashing from the chinese the nepalis have stood up to them they have had problems with bangladesh also they also of course had problems with pakistan so in that context we have strategic space and our relations with afghanistan and iran are improving so in that context how do we use this asian century mm -hmm. this strategic space to our advantage mm -hmm. and i think that is the key challenge for us for the next few years yes yes uh, you're absolutely right mishayat sahab and you mentioned uh, the soviet uh, invasion of afghanistan and then the war on terror and uh, the us and pakistan uh, cooperated deeply uh, in both of these conflicts but in the future uh, do you see pakistan uh, shifting uh, its key ally from the us to china well in the afghanistan situation uh, the cooperation was not just pakistan and the us mm -hmm. china was also with us mm -hmm. europe was with us egypt and saudi arabia was with us so it was basically a part of the cold war to combat the soviet union and those opposed to the soviet union were all together mm -hmm. and of course the key role was pakistan and the pakistan american connection mm -hmm. but uh, in terms of uh, strategy if you see the situation china has been a reliable strategic partner of pakistan mm -hmm. why do we call china an all weather friend mm -hmm. because whether the weather is good meaning the situation may not be good for pakistan regionally or the weather is bad and uh, either way china stands by us mm -hmm. america is a tactical partner mm -hmm. when they need us because of geopolitics mm -hmm. they come to pakistan to seek our assistance in the 50s it was the cold war they needed us against the soviet union mm -hmm. in 71 they needed us to have the opening to china mm -hmm. in the 80s they needed pakistan for the afghanistan war after 911 they needed pakistan on the so called war on terror mm -hmm. now they need us for afghanistan but after that need is no longer there mm -hmm. their strategic preference in the region is india not pakistan mm -hmm. while china is a reliable partner irrespective mm -hmm. of any changes in the global situation mm -hmm. so we are not seeking sides this is the old relationship china and pakistan in fact this year is the 70th anniversary of pakistan china diplomatic relations so the relationships has been strong stable predictable and resilient mm. unlike the united states mm. so we welcome the cooperation with the us mm. but it has to be on our terms in accordance with our interests mm. and uh, 60 years ago it was field marshal ayub khan who was very pro american who was very close to america he took the decision along with his foreign minister zulfikar ali bhutto to have the opening to china mm -hmm. and uh, at that time we were the most aligned ally of the united states we were part of cento we were part of cato we had given them bases in bada bear mm -hmm. uh, we had a security agreement with them but still because of our national interest we went to china mm -hmm. to seek the support especially against india mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we are very clear on our interest and it's that relationship since the days of field marshal ayub and also uh, zulfikar ali bhutto has continued mm -hmm. irrespective of the whether the government is civilian or military mm -hmm. because it is in our national interest mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that has not changed the world has changed our relations with the us has changed many times but not our relationship with china and china is the pivot of our foreign policy and it will remain so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes and in the long term strategy uh, we have various reports uh, from the Asian Development Bank and investment banks like Goldman Sachs who uh, which reflect that uh, Asia will dominate uh, the economics of the world in the coming decades but do you also see a shift in the political and military power from west to east I think it was a British think tank at the end of December 
the Center for Economy and Business Research in London, which announced that in the next five, six years, China will overtake the United States. I think they said by 2028, mm -hmm. China will be the number one economy. China mm -hmm. is now following second uh, biggest economy after the United States. And they said that in the next five, six years, China would grow at 5.7% per annum and uh, the US would grow at 1.9% per annum. So this is uh, something which is not just uh, Goldman Sachs or the Asian Development Bank or the World Bank. Now this is accepted as a universal mm -hmm. truth, mm -hmm. as something which is perhaps inevitable. And uh, the important thing is that China's rise is somehow being linked willingly with America's retrenchment and retreat mm -hmm. from our region. Mm -hmm. Once America was the sole superpower, but the decline of the United States began, I think, I would date it to 2003, when they launched a war in Iraq, mm -hmm. which was illegal, which was unjust, which was immoral. Mm -hmm. And on false pretenses. And which was based on a lie, mm -hmm. total falsehood. Mm -hmm. Bush lied, Blair lied, they deceived their own people, they deceived the world. And they thought they could control the world because it was part of that imperial hubris to dominate. They had no reason to, because Saddam Hussein, whatever his other uh, crimes or his other uh, ills or wrongs may be, he had nothing to do with 9-11. Mm -hmm. That was not linked with that 9-11. But they, it was an ideological war to decimate a country which was not under their domination. And that became the turning point. And I think the Afghan failure, in my view, is also linked with the war in Iraq. Because mm -hmm. without sta settling and stabilizing Afghanistan, they went into Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Iraqi resistance took place. Mm -hmm. And then that led, the American eye was off the ball in Afghanistan, the uh, Taliban res resurgence took place. And the Taliban at that time, if you remember, in uh, the Bonn conference in 2001, they were begging, please give us a place on the table. We are willing to mm -hmm. compromise. Mm -hmm. But uh, the new cons, the hawks in the Bush administration so shot it down. They were so mm -hmm. arrogant. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, on 1st of May 2003, Bush in uh, Baghdad, in, uh, he announced and Rumsfeld, his defense secretary, announced in Kabul, mission accomplished. They have won the war. It reminds me of a Quranic verse, wa makaru wa makaru Allah wa Allah ul khairul makarin. They planned, Almighty Allah planned. Verily, He is the best of the planners. See, the sole superpower is only the Almighty Allah. And once we know that, He has the key. Not any country, not any individual, not any so called superpower on earth mm -hmm. and today we see the results before you the mm -hmm. arrogance of power mm -hmm. yes yes you're right and you mentioned uh, the downfall of america since uh, 2003 and the war in iraq but we've also seen most of the innovation in the world especially in the realm of tech which has come to dominate our lives to a great extent uh, it comes from the west and from the us uh, we have companies like facebook apple and google uh, which are products of uh, U.S. innovation. So do you think Asia can also uh, build products uh, like this? And what can Asia do to build the next big thing in tech? You see, now we are, everybody's talking of the coming Cold War, mm. that there's a new Cold War coming. Mm. And you ask this question also, whether this is only economic resurgence or is it linked to other issues also? Mm. You can see, for example, the Asia Pacific region mm. has now been rebranded, given a new label by the Americans, Indo-Pacific. Mm. Although Asia-Pacific is a very inclusive term. Indo-Pacific, they want to rope in India. India is part of the Indian Ocean, not the Pacific Ocean. Mm. And this is the wrong term. But basically, they feel that Asia-Pacific was an American lake dominated by American sea power, military power, economic power. That is no longer the case. Mm -hmm. China is asserting itself, whether it's the South China Sea, mm -hmm. whether it's the issue of Taiwan, mm -hmm. Hong Kong, 
and uh, America has 400 military bases in Asia. China has none outside its uh, borders. Mm -hmm. But you can see that they want to contain China. Mm -hmm. And they have built up what is called the Quad. Mm -hmm. US, Australia, Japan and India. Mm -hmm. And already President Biden had a first uh, summit on that issue also. The coming war is more significant. It's high tech. Mm -hmm. It's about innovation. Mm -hmm. It's about technology. It's about robotics. It's about artificial intelligence. Because that was an area which was dominated. And rightly, even now it's dominated. by them. America's strength is its soft power. And also it's high tech. They have the best universities, the best scientists, technological prowess. But China is not catching up. China has developed very fast. They used to call China the factory of the world. Then they call China the civil engineer of the world. Mm -hmm. Now China is aspiring to be a leader in artificial intelligence. 5G, mm -hmm. that is the brand of Huawei now. Why is Huawei seen as a certain threat? Because it's competing directly with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, previously we had uh, the American companies, we had uh, Ericsson, we had other companies in Finland, Nokia. But mm -hmm. Huawei has now taken over. And also, I think the high-tech companies are also being viewed now negatively for the first time in, within America. Mm -hmm. Because they have seemed to have an ideological agenda also. Mm -hmm. On Facebook and Twitter, if you talk of Kashmir or Palestine, your posts are deleted mm -hmm. or they are censored. And also, in the last two American presidential elections, the Americans have accused the Russians and the Chinese of intervening through high tech, mm -hmm. through the same instruments that they used, mm -hmm. social media, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. Although it's interesting that America itself has a record of interventions in most third world countries, mm -hmm. politically, mm -hmm. to destabilize governments, mm -hmm. to overthrow governments, whether through hard coups or soft coups. And mm -hmm. Pakistan has seen both. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in that context, uh, I feel that uh, the Americans have now realized that China is coming of age, Asia is coming of age, and they feel that uh, uh, they need a new enemy. Mm -hmm. They had the Soviet Union in the Cold War, then for a period it was Islam, but then what they did to the Muslim world, we know, now it's China. Mm -hmm. And they want to forge a consensus on that. Although the basis is false. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a very good article by Fried Zakaria I was reading in uh, Foreign Affairs. Mm -hmm. And it was called the New China Scare. And he said how this threat is being conjured up. Mm -hmm. And then you create an enemy, then you demonize the enemy. Mm -hmm. They try to demonize during this coronavirus pandemic also. Mm -hmm. And then they try to cobble a coalition to combat this enemy. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. And Mushayat Sab, let's talk a, a bit about culture. Uh, do you think Pakistan is more culturally aligned with the US or with China? You see, culturally, uh, it's very interesting. Strategically and culturally, uh, strategically and politically, Pakistan is pro-China. Mm -hmm. But culturally, our ruling elites whether in Khaki or in Mufti, mm -hmm. are pro-West. Mm -hmm. English language, mm -hmm. colonial domination, mm -hmm. and uh, cultural compatibility. World Bank, IMF, Asian Development Bank, mm -hmm. uh, Aid to Pakistan Consortium. So we always look towards Washington, London, Brussels, Paris, mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, the children of the elite also study in the West. Mm -hmm. They speak the language. Mm -hmm. So culturally, there's more compatibility with the West. Mm -hmm. But strategically and politically, we are aligned towards China. Mm -hmm. So this is a dichotomy, but this happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are interests which are there. Mm -hmm. Indian elite was uh, very, very pro-British pro-West after independence, the Nehru period. 
and uh, but in the cold war culturally they were pro west but strategically they were pro soviet union mm -hmm. and they had an alliance yes so that was mm -hmm. uh, so that is a uh, interesting dichotomy but it uh, prevails in lot of other countries also but do you think increased people to people contacts and connections will uh, uh, reduce this uh, cultural asymmetry between pakistan and china i would say that uh, we live in a globalized world hmm. let's take now uh, china and pakistan culturally there are 28000 pakistani students studying in china hmm. I think 10 15 years ago there were 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, there are Chinese language classes in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. You go to places there are Chinese in Pakistan also. Mm -hmm. Today there are more Chinese in Pakistan than there are Westerners in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. This is the first time in our history. Normally mm -hmm. there's a large presence there. Mm -hmm. And uh, though, at the height of the American Iran relationship in 1979 when the revolution took place under imam khomeini there were mm -hmm. 50000 americans mm -hmm. in iran mm -hmm. and the revolution violently overthrew the shah of iran who was pro west mm -hmm. but the iranians still have a very strong cultural compatibility with the west or with iran of uh, iran and uh, us iran and uh, france even in uk but mm -hmm. they were politically very anti west So mm -hmm. I think in with China, there's a realization in the people of Pakistan very clearly that this is uh, we this is our future. Mm -hmm. And for example, movies are now being made. Chale the saath saath, a Chinese and Pakistani romance story, mm -hmm. which was not never there before. Mm -hmm. Movies which are now being dubbed in Chinese. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think soft power is going to be extremely important. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in China two years ago for the. dialogue of civilizations and mm -hmm. there was a banquet by president xi jinping mm -hmm. and uh, there was a main table with the president and we were in the second table and next to me was i noticed this gentleman and i asked i said are you from india i just noticed because he was dressed differently wearing glasses mm -hmm. he said uh, my name is amir khan the famous actor mm -hmm. i said oh it's a pleasure to meet you and we are mm -hmm. very good because he has relatives in karachi also mm -hmm. and he's a big fan of moin akhtar He said, "This mm. is my favorite actor." Mm. So I asked Amir Khan, "How come you are here?" Mm. He said, "I'm here because uh, the movie Dangal mm. was very popular. It was dubbed in Chinese. Mm. So you can see soft power, mm. culture, is very important. Mm. And I think in this age, the strength of India has been Bollywood has been a very important instrument mm. for America. Also, in fact, I all I feel that Hollywood is the de facto." Ministry of Propaganda of the American establishment, mm -hmm. because Hollywood is always mm -hmm. used mm -hmm. as a weapon, as an instrument. Mm -hmm. And this happened after 9/11. Uh, one month after 9/11, uh, the special assistant to President Bush, Karl Rove, he was his main strategic advisor. He called the Hollywood producers and big executives, mm -hmm. MGM and Warner Brothers and Disney, and Fox News. He said, "We are now at war, and I want Hollywood to play that role." Mm. the media so this is a very important instrument culture mm. and uh, that's why i say hollywood is the de facto ministry of propaganda mm. because they are used they produce mm. movies with themes mm. in the remember the last james bond movie was about north korea mm. Mm. because they wanted to demonize north korea mm. then it's about chinese villains or muslim vill villains Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the, so the, the so this culture thing is very important and i i think there's becoming more cultural compatibility between pakistan and china now mm -hmm. and uh, that is extremely important but the important thing is that the relationship is uh, uh quite strong at the people to people level mm -hmm. and it is interests mutual interest that bind mm -hmm. we have so many muslim countries 57 of them and uh, we have a common faith but we are not close to all of them mm -hmm. so because of uh, lack of commonality of interests mm -hmm. yes and i think you saw pakistan's uh, strategic shift towards <coughs> china many years ago even before uh, anyone thought of cpec and you founded uh, the pakistan china institute so would you like to tell us uh, what the institute does and how it's uh, helping 
people to people uh, connections between Pakistanis and the Chinese people? You see, I come from Lahore mm. and I was a student in FC College. Mm. And I first discovered China in the 70s. I was a teenager then, studying mm. in second year in FC College. And I went to China mm. as a part of a youth group mm. activist. So, and since then, I've made in the last uh, 45 years or so almost uh, 100 visits. Mm, so wow. I've seen the China of Chairman Mao, mm. Premier Zhou Enlai, mm. China of Deng Xiaoping, China of Xi Jinping. So I always was fascinated by China. Mm. And the Park Chin Dosti, you know, we were students mm. and we were uh, talking of Park Chin Dosti because China had supported Pakistan in the 65 war. China had supported Pakistan in the 71 war. Mm. So I felt that uh, China uh, is uh, fascinating. And when I went to America for my studies, I studied in the School of Foreign Service in Georgetown, in Washington. Mm. I also studied at the Institute of Sino-Soviet Studies, the Chinese Revolution, mm. Chinese history. They were top American experts who were teaching us uh, about China. So I learned about China and despite all these visits, I still think I'm still a student of mm. China because China is so complex and uh, so vast and so diverse mm. that you always learn about China at every visit. So I felt that there was a missing ingredient in Pakistan-China relationship. Mm. We have a very close relationship between the two states, between mm. the two governments, between the two militaries, people to people at the awam level at youth students intellectuals universities think tanks I think that opinion leaders mm -hmm. that was a missing dimension so I felt the need that there should be a platform so it was a labor of love mm -hmm. it was an idea mm -hmm. and uh, that idea was in my mind that they should be so that I launched this thing and it was just an idea and uh, we launched it on 1st October 9, 2009 mm -hmm. and mashallah by the grace of God and this was before CPAC, mm -hmm. before Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. before talk of the Asian century mm -hmm. and before people felt that suddenly we would be so that close. Mm -hmm. We were good friends but so I think we were a little ahead of our times but I'm glad we have been proven correct. <laughs> And mashallah, it's been a, a good inning so far. But did you know at that time that Pakistan and China would become such important strategic partners? Well, I always felt one thing, that the 21st century would belong to us, to Asians. Mm -hmm. And if it belongs to the Asians, China is the key country. And China is our neighbor, China is our best friend. Because I was seeing the rise of China. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading a very interesting article in the Atlantic, which is an American publication, May 2009. And mm -hmm. uh, in that it was written by Robert Kaplan, professor. Mm -hmm. He talked, he had visited Gwadar. And in that visit, he talked that Gwadar can be the Rotterdam of mm -hmm. Asia. Rotterdam mm -hmm. is the top port of uh, Europe in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And because Gwadar is the shortest access for Xinjiang, mm. Kashgar in China, for Dushanbe, mm. for Almaty and Astana in Kazakhstan, for Tashkent, for Samarkand, for Bukhara, mm. for Ashgabad mm. and uh, for Bishkek. Mm. So this is the future. Mm. And the potential of Gwadar was pointed out before mm. it became part of uh, CPAC. Mm. Because Gwadar was built by uh, the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And the first vision of Gawadar was pointed out by Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. And it was in 1992, mm -hmm. when he was Prime Minister, uh, at a Quetta conference of the ECO, Economic Cooperation Organization. Mm -hmm. They talked of Gawadar as the port. Mm -hmm. So that vision was there, it was realized, built by the Chinese in 2003, to, completed in 2007, and then, uh, 2013 it was handed over again. First we handed it over to a Singapore company which couldn't run it. Mm -hmm. Then it was handed over to the Chinese company. 2013. Mm -hmm. Then today it is the centerpiece of CPAC. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically if I, as a student I saw the trend of history was very clear. Mm -hmm. That the shift in the balance of power was there. This happens. 
Mm. Western colonialism collapsed in the uh, 20th century and the American century has come to an end in the early part of the 21st century. And now it's the turn of the Asian century. Mm -hmm. So these are cycles of change in history. And mm -hmm. Almighty has been very kind. Mm -hmm. We are very fortunate thanks to the Qaeda Azam that we are free citizens of a free country. Mm -hmm. See what is happening to the Muslims in India. Mm -hmm. That Qaeda Azam had this vision mm -hmm. over 80 years ago in Lahore, 23rd March 1942. Mm -hmm. Seek a independent state for the Muslims of South Asia. Mm -hmm. And so we can see that Pakistan has that role. Pakistan must realize that potential mm -hmm. for which our founding fathers worked so hard. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you know, we understand that the Asian century implies that China uh, will dominate the world, but India will be uh, number two in the Asian century. So how do you think Pakistan will balance India's rise in Asia? Well, I think that the Asian century means all of Asia. Mm -hmm. It should include not just China, includes India, Pakistan, Singapore, even Japan. Mm -hmm. When I meet uh, uh, ambassadors of Japan or Australia, I said, you are from Asia. Play your role. Mm -hmm. You are looking thousands of miles away uh, mm -hmm. towards Washington. Have an approach. Be part, of, be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Stop talking of a cold war. Stop mm -hmm. talking of a containment. Japan has been leading in innovation and Japan has had many uh, uh, developments, pride, pride in that. Asian Tigers, mm -hmm. seen how they have developed. Mm -hmm. So it's a, and, but we should be part of the Asian century, which means connectivity and cooperation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean Cold War and containment. Unfortunately, India is on the wrong side of history. Mm -hmm. It is joining in the campaign to demonize China, to contain China, to combat China, that will not work. It is against India's own interests. This should be part of the project. For me, the Asian century operationally defined, what does it mean? It means CPAC, it means connectivity, it means Pakistan is the hub, linking South Asia with uh, China, with Iran, with Afghanistan. In fact, I'm, I feel that a greater South Asia is emerging. Mm -hmm. as a geoeconomic concept, not mm -hmm. just as a political or a geographical concept, geoeconomic. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Greater South Asia includes not just the South Asian subcontinent of Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan and uh, the Maldives, mm -hmm. but it includes China, it includes Iran, it includes uh, uh, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. it includes uh, Myanmar, it includes uh, the Central Asian Republics of Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. And we are the hub of regional connectivity. Mm -hmm. It should also include the Iran-Pakistan pipeline. And India should rejoin mm -hmm. the pipeline. Mm -hmm. It should include the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline, TAPI. Mm -hmm. So that is what the future is. Driven by roads, railways, energy, economy, ports, pipelines. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy that uh, two weeks ago, the agreement was signed. Pakistan, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan Railway. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking of the biggest project of CPEC and the second phase of CPEC is going to be the ML1, mainline one. 1,872 mm -hmm. kilometers, Karachi to Peshawar. Mm -hmm. Upgradation and dualization of the railroad, mm -hmm. which is the biggest transformation of the Pakistan Railway in the last 70 years. Mm -hmm. And that should extend to Jalalabad, mm -hmm. go up north to Mazar Sharif and to Tarmez, which is the Uzbek city on the Afghanistan, Turkish, uh, Tur Afghanistan or Uzbekistan border. Mm -hmm. And this rail connection, the whole world will be transformed. Mm -hmm. We have to bid goodbye to wrong policies of the past, mm -hmm. of Cold War or containment. We had wrong, flawed policies in Afghanistan. I think mm -hmm. we have learned our lessons. Mm -hmm. Both our political establishment and our military establishment have learned those lessons. Mm -hmm. They have reversed those wrongs in Afghanistan. Now we are trying to reach out. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, uh, it's important that India also learn a lesson from that. The attempt to bully, to dominate, to be the hegemon in the region will not work. Mm -hmm. The important future is connectivity, cooperation and the Belt and Road Initiative is very inclusive. It provides for win-win cooperation for everybody. 
Nobody is excluded. Nobody is a loser. Everybody is a winner. Mm-hmm. And that's the future. Mm-hmm. But Mushayat Sab, given the inevitability of uh, the Asian century, how do you see Pakistan's foreign policy evolving in the next 50 years? And do you think we will be able to maintain a close strategic relationship with the United States? There was a very famous Israeli statesman. He was foreign minister of Israel. His name was Abba Iban. When I was a student in Washington, I, I often heard his speeches at the think tanks. Very articulate. He once said about uh, some of the Palestinians, which is not a good comment, but he said that, oh, my friends uh, in the PLO, they never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> I think this also applies to Pakistan. Mm-hmm. We never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. We had a great opportunity in the 1990s, after the end of the Cold War, Mm -hmm. Afghanistan, to bring peace. But no, we made a mistake. We talked of strategic depth. Mm -hmm. We talked of domination of Afghanistan. We we thought only we could do that, instead Mm -hmm. of being more inclusive, bringing the region. And we got our fingers burnt. Mm-hmm. The hard way. And monsters were created, Frankenstein monsters. Mm-hmm. Who have now trying to devour our own. And now we are learning those lessons. Mm-hmm. Extremism. Mm-hmm. Which became violent also. So I think that this is again a historic opportunity. Mm-hmm. Then the opportunities which were there in the region also. Mm-hmm. So I think that. It's important. I was talking, I remember uh, three, four years ago, we were there at uh, 6th of September, uh, the Defense Day function. I was chairman of the Defense Committee and I was talking, General Rahil Sharif was there, General Bajwa also. And uh, I think from our side, uh, myself and Sadar Yas Sadik, speaker then, Khurshid Shah Sab, the uh, leader of the opposition. Mm-hmm. And we were talking with the generals, as I said, General Saab, make new mistakes. Don't repeat <laughs> old ones, <laughs> especially in Afghanistan. Mm. Because the old mistakes mm. will lead to the same consequences we've had before. Mm. As uh, Einstein rightly said, trying to do the same thing mm. over and over again and expecting a different re- outcome is either insanity or stupidity. <laughs> so I mm. think that we have learned our lessons. We should move forward mm-hmm. and uh, stabilize Pakistan. Mm-hmm. Of course, it has been said before, Mia Saab said it also, General Bajwa also set our own house in order. That mm-hmm. goes that's, uh, that's, goes without saying, but take practical steps for that. Pakistan needs today a healing touch. Mm-hmm. Because the issues are such that no one person, no one party, no one institution, no one government alone can do this. Mm-hmm. It has to be a collective effort mm-hmm. to build a better tomorrow for our people. Mm-hmm. And that is what is needed. Mm-hmm. And if they have to make mistakes, make new mistakes. <laughs> but don't repeat old ones. <laughs> <laughs> but, and Mishayat Saab, you've had the privilege of, uh, see, uh, of witnessing the makings of uh, history and you've seen foreign affairs very closely. But what advice would you like to give to young people who are interested in foreign affairs but they find the subject too complicated? It's not that complicated. Mm-hmm. First of all, the subject should be, it should come from the heart. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it has to be a passion. Mm-hmm. For me, foreign affairs is a passion. Mm-hmm. I always tell my son that I'm very fortunate that my hobby is my job. <laughs> so you know that uh, it's something which I like doing. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people, I meet uh, uh, civil services and they have the word doctor. I said, how come you were a medical doctor? He said, we started studying medicine, then we realized we made a mistake after five, ten years. Then we mm-hmm. shifted to other fields. So I think it's important that if they like foreign affairs, and foreign affairs affects us. Mm-hmm. For the last 40 years, 50 years, what has happened in the region has driven Pakistan's internal development. Mm-hmm. It's shaped by foreign policy, by foreign affairs, our role, for good and bad, because we are located in a very strategic part of the world. Mm-hmm. So I would say that, come into it, 
curiosity listen to the news read the newspapers follow what is happening around it open your minds mm-hmm. don't have closed minds mm-hmm. learn i'm very fortunate i learn every day mm-hmm. from different people i learn from you i learn from meeting people i learn from studying i learn from traveling i learn from reading mm-hmm. so if you are if you are a good student you will be a good teacher eventually <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. Thank you very much for your time, Mushayat Sir. We're extremely Thank grateful. Thank you. It's a pleasure, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Mushayat Sir. Thank you.